Welcome to the Cystic Fibrosis Foundation's Virtual Patient Education Day, Using Nutrition to Stay Healthy with Cystic Fibrosis, uh, sponsored by an, education, an unrestricted educational grant from Genentech. I'm Leslie Hazel, Director of Patient Resources at the Cystic Fibrosis Foundation. This webcast will focus on how you can stay healthy with, through nutrition. Our presenters are from the Children's Lung and Cystic Fibrosis Center at the Women and Children's Hospital of Buffalo, New York. Dr. Drusi Borowitz is the director of the CF Care Center. Chris Coburn Miller is the dietitian for both children and adults with cystic fibrosis. And Joe Cronin is the director of the adult CF program. We will begin with short presentations from Drusi, Chris, and Joe about guidelines for healthy weight, how busy adults with CF fit nutrition into their life, and what you can do to use nutrition to stay healthy. We will then have a time of answering questions that have been submitted during registration and during this presentation. Please submit your questions during this live broadcast by typing it into the lower left-hand corner of your webcast window. However, questions not related to nutrition or that ask for medical advice will not be asked or answered. To learn about quality improvements in cystic fibrosis, CF Research, building life skills to manage CF, patient advocacy related to insurance and government programs, total lung care, and how to avoid germs, please watch an archived webcast on the Cystic Fibrosis Foundation website. As with our previous webcast, this one will also be archived. Now it is my pleasure to turn this over to Drusi, Chris, and Joe. Thanks, Leslie. We're gonna get started with a brief series of slides just to sort of set the scene a little bit and talk about how to use nutrition to stay healthy with cystic fibrosis. So let's start out with a picture of Taylor, a school-aged child from our CF Center who's cheering us on to our goal, which is to have people lead healthy, full lives from childhood through adulthood. And this is Nancy, another patient who's followed in our adult program with her daughter, enjoying that kind of nice, vibrant life that we hope everyone will have. So how can we use nutrition to help people lead healthy lives? Well, one of the things that we've learned through quality improvement efforts at our CF centers is that it's helpful to have something to measure, something to follow along. So I want to spend a little bit of time talking about how we can measure nutrition in, in a global general way. So the number that we use for infants and for children who are under two years of age is called weight for length. We measure how long the baby is and weigh the baby, and we come up with a ratio of those things. And your CF Center dietitian can show you that on a graph at your CF Center. For children who are age two up to young adults age 20, we use something called body mass index percentile. So body mass index, or BMI, is your weight in kilograms divided by your height in meters squared. Now, doctors tend to use the metric system, but many people think about their weight and height in terms of pounds and in terms of inches. And so if you want to use an easy way to do that conversion, you can go to the Centers for Disease Control website at www.cdc.gov. If you put in your weight in pounds and your height in inches, it'll give you your BMI and your BMI percentile. And we use percentile in children age two up to young adults age 20 because height is changing so much during that period of time. And we really want to be able to track a measure of nutrition over a lifetime. For adults, we use the absolute number, BMI, again, weight in kilograms, divided by height in meters squared. Now, why do we care about these things? The reason we care about them is because there's a very tight connection between nutritional status and lung function. So I want to walk through a few graphs so that you understand why it's important to track your nutritional status and then let us focus a little bit later on on uh, ways to help people stay healthy using nutrition. So this is a graph of a BMI percentile and you can see along the bottom line here BMI percentiles from the left, which are the low numbers, less than the 5th percentile, 5th, 10th, etc., all the way up to the numbers on the right, um, uh, to the higher percentiles. And uh, so the, the, the thinnest and the least well-nourished people are on the left, and the better-nourished people are on the right. 
And then along the tall axis, along the side, you can see FEV1 percent predicted. FEV1 is a measure of lung function. It stands for forced expiratory volume in one second. So your lungs have a lot of tubes that go down into them, and if the tubes are open, the air will come out very fast. But if they're filled with mucus or infection or inflammation, the air will come out, but not quite as fast in that first second. So it's a measure of how much obstruction, infection, or inflammation there is in your lungs. What you can see with this green line, which is at the 50th percentile for BMI, a nice average for the general population, not just for people with CF, but the general population, that there's a fairly flat relationship between lung function and BMI percentile. Now, can I tell you that um, improving your BMI percentile will improve your lung function? Well, it's, it's a little bit hard to know what's the chicken and what's the egg. But you can only control what you can control. And the things that are within your control are to keep your weight in as uh, good a place as possible so that your BMI percentile or your absolute BMI is at the higher end of the graph. And to do the things that you need to do to keep your lungs healthy, regular airway clearance, exercise, and taking your regular medicines to prevent lung problems. The next graph shows you pretty much the same thing, but for adults. And as I mentioned, in adults, we use the absolute number for BMI. So you can see along the bottom now numbers from the very thinnest adults with a BMI of 15 or 16, all the way up to the numbers on the other side. And a BMI over 30 would be considered overweight. We do use different numbers for women and for men. So our goal is to have women have a BMI of about 22 or higher and for men to have a BMI of 23 or higher. And again, you see this very flat relationship above those numbers between FEV1% predicted, our number that helps us measure uh, lung function, and BMI, the measure that we have for nutrition. I'm just going to show one more graph, and this one's a little bit more complicated. But it talks about the fact that the more you weigh early in life, the taller you'll be as an adult. And the reason that's important is that I said that we use FEV1% predicted. It's predicted for your height. The taller you are, the bigger your lungs are. And we'd really like people to have as big, a lungs, big lungs as they possibly can. Um, what we talk about is reaching your genetic potential. So if your parents are tall, the chances are you'll be tall. That's your genetic potential. If your parents are shorter, your genetic potential is that you're likely to be shorter. But we want you to be as tall as you could be. In this graph, we are looking at how fast people grow in a year. What's the rate that they grow at in a year? So along the bottom are different ages, starting on the left with ages 2, 3, and 4, and going up to uh, teenage and young adulthood on the right. And then on that tall axis, what you can see is how many centimeters somebody grows in a year. So how fast you grow in height during that year. The red line is people who start out early in life with a weight at the 50th percentile or higher. So people whose weight is a little bit on the higher side, maybe even a little bit chubby. And what you can see is early in life, they grow faster. And when they hit their spurt of growth at puberty, which is the peak that you see later on on the right side of the graph, they actually grow taller. So they hit puberty, they grow faster when they're younger, grow taller when they're younger. They grow taller when they hit puberty, compared to people who started out in life with a weight um, that was much lower than that. And those people never grow as many inches early in life. They hit puberty at a later age, and they never quite get that same pubertal growth spurt. So they probably aren't reaching their full genetic potential. Again, not getting as tall and not having lungs that are as big. So one of those are, that's another reason why focusing on nutrition is important. Let's talk a little bit about normal nutrition and then one of the main reasons why people with CF have trouble keeping their weight on. So this is a picture of a stomach and tucked behind the stomach is an organ called the pancreas. The pancreas makes enzymes that digest up food and there's a little tiny duct that goes through the pancreas called the pancreatic duct and it enables those enzymes to be squirted up into the small intestine, high up in the small intestine, to enable you to digest up all the foods that you need to eat so that you can absorb the nutrients. And you can see 
uh, on the top left hand there, kind of a blow up picture of where that little tube comes right into the small intestine from the pancreas. In this next slide on the lower right, you can see that there's a plugging of that tube with some sludging. And instead of the enzymes being able to leave the pancreas and go into the small intestine where they belong, they end up backing up into the pancreas and basically digesting up the pancreas and destroying it. So about 90% of people with cystic fibrosis don't have a working pancreas and don't have the enzymes that they need to absorb all of the nutrients in food. So what do we do to treat this? What we do is we give people enzyme capsules and um, that enables them to absorb the nutrients in food. Now, enzymes work well, although they don't work perfectly, and so people with CF still have some trouble absorbing food, but taking enzymes before every meal and snack can really help. The main enzymes that are in these capsules are of three kinds. Lipases digest up lipid, Lipid is the doctor word for fats. So in this meal, they help digest up the fat that's in the hamburger, the fat that's in the cheese, and the fat that's in the milk. And also, there are special nutrients, fat-soluble vitamins, that um, will only be absorbed if you're absorbing fat. And so it's important to be able to digest up those lipids or those fats so that you'll absorb those vitamins. And those vitamins are protective of your lungs. And we'll talk a little bit about vitamins later on. Proteases are enzymes that help digest protein. So in this meal, there's protein in the hamburger, protein in the cheese, and protein in the milk. And amylase helps digest up starches. So there's starch in the hamburger bun and starch in the french fries. So taking enzymes before every meal and snack is important. And even when people do that, there's a certain amount of fat and nutrients that don't get absorbed. And so that's one of the reasons why people with CF really need to work to take in extra calories. And what we want people to do is to be a little bit on the chubbier side. So I want to turn it over to Chris for a minute, who's going to summarize a few things, and then we'll go into a few uh, practical approaches to this. Chris? Thank you, Tracy. So how do you uh, maintain a good nutritional status and get the calories in that you need? Um, the first thing is to eat a diet that's um, high in calorie and high in fat and have regular meals and snacks throughout the day. This may require a lot of um, planning um, with a school-aged child. It may mean looking at the school menu, um, have them bring it home from school and try and pick out the meal, um, the lunch meals that are going to be higher in calories and fat. Or if they're not offering um, appropriate meals, then it may mean packing a lunch for your kids. Um, you can take them to the grocery store with you and you can help um, you know, pick out foods that are going to be higher in calories and high in fat and things that they're going to want to eat. For the adult, it also means some planning. Um, they may need you need to take some snacks with them to work, um, something like peanuts, which are higher in calories, um, and you know, figure out how they're going to pack their lunch, when they're going to be able to eat, or if they're going to be eating out. Uh, also, it's good for the family to establish some good mealtime um, behaviors. You want dinner at home to be a good time where you're sitting around as a family and talking and you know, seeing how everybody's day was and not a time where there's a lot of meal battles going on. Um, Juicy's going to address this a little bit later about um, mealtime behaviors and how maybe to change some of the behaviors that may be going on at the table if it's getting to be an unpleasant time. Um, you want to make sure that you're taking enzymes with every meal and every snack. It's very important for children to make sure that you're establishing good behaviors with enzymes with them so they know that if they're going to be eating a meal or snack, they need to take their enzymes first. And as, when that habit's established when they're young, they'll carry it on through their school and into adulthood. Um, it's also important to make sure that you're taking a CF vitamin every day. And a good time to take a vitamin is when you're eating meals and taking enzymes so you're able to absorb um, all the vitamins um, from that multivitamin that you're taking. We're going to show you a little video clip. Um, in our clinic, we um, do what we call their calorie contest. And it's just a way um, to start educating kids and their parents about how to make um, better selections for high calorie meals. Um, looking into like getting ready to read some labels. Um, with the calorie contest, um, they figure out a calorie in the meal. And we give them the answer and along with some recipes. You know, they might find something that they want to try one time that's a little bit higher in calories um, and decide that they, they may like it. So I'd like to watch this little bit of video clip with um, a family doing their calorie contest. 
Hello, I'm Chris Coburn Miller. I'm a registered dietitian at the CF Center at Women and Children's Hospital of Buffalo. And today we're going to um, go over our calorie contest um, that we do in our clinic. And we have Zach and Alex Barbell with us today. Um, Zach is an eight year old with CF, and his brother um, Alex is five. And also their mother is with us today, Carrie Sparbell. Um, this calorie contest is something that we do in our clinic um, with all of our pediatric patients. And we'd like them to come in and view our, um, our tray of food and figure out how many calories and grams of fat are in this food. Um, they put their answer in the box. Um, each week there's a winner. Um, the person that's closest to the amount of calories in the food wins $5 from McDonald's because we do like our CF patients to um, have a diet that's high in fat and high in calories. Um, so I'm going to ask the boys to participate in our calorie contest. So I'm going to ask you each to look at the food. Your mom can help you if you need some help of everything we have here on the tray. Just like we do when we go to clinic. So we have a slice of pizza, pepperonis. We do have um, some grapes. There's about 20 of them. And then we have a drink. It's a uh, milkshake, cookies and milk. And then also a fruit sorbet, things sort of, you know, like a frozen fruit that you put into the freezer. So I want you to look at this and think about how many calories do you think is in this whole tray of food and the grams of fat. So put your name on the sheet and then you can start looking at it. Right down here. Let's think. The milk's probably at least 10, if not more. I'd say 10. Okay. Pizza? Okay, so that's 25. I don't even think there's any fat in grapes, but I don't know. Is there? No, <laughs> she, well, she can't help us. We're done. How many are you going to say? You want to drop it in here? How many grams of fat do you think? About 25. Shit. Okay, right, 2 5 right here on this line. I know what it is. Okay. Good job. Okay, now put it right in the, box. in the box. Okay. So you ready for the answer? Good job, buddy. So the amount of calories in the meal is 972. You were both so very, very close. close. Um, the grams of fat were 27. Oh, you were only two off on that. So the, the milk has about 360 calories in it, 10 grams of fat. And a lot of these milks, like they have, supposed to be like two servings instead of one. Um, the slice of pizza is about 350 calories, 17 grams of fat. There's no, you know, fat at all in the grapes. It's about 72 calories, and there's no fat at all in um, the raspberry um, fruits roll, and it has about 190 calories. And then you can increase the calories in this meal a little bit. You can put like some Parmesan cheese on your pizza and add a little bit more calories that way. You can even dip the pizza like in blue cheese dip, you know, when you're eating or it. Or ranch. We have some people like that. The, um, the grapes and stuff, you can dip it in like a Cool Whip kind of mixture. You know, add a little bit of extra calories that way. Okay. And then there's a few other you know, like recipes on here. You may want to try something at home, like a fruit and cream that you can make for your fruits and um, miracle pudding. Okay. Excellent. So then at the end of our clinic visit, we'll find out who's the winner, whoever's closest, and they'll get their $5 from McDonald's. I want to thank you guys for participating in the calorie contest. Okay. You're welcome. You're welcome. Now we'll take a few moments to talk about uh, the adult population and the role of nutrition in maintaining health in the adult uh, setting. Uh, adulthood is a wonderful time of increasing independence and autonomy, but also a great personal responsibility. As you can see from this slide here, we're getting uh, quite a few more uh, adult CF pa patients uh, due to the successes and advances of both nutritional therapies as well as airway clearance and in control of infection. Now, coming into adulthood, we meet many social settings in which we'll have to negotiate the skill set that we learned as children in integrating uh, a high calorie diet into our life and negotiating with the rest of the population. Uh, just a brief cross-section of the adult population here. As we can see, a majority of uh, adults with CF have, uh, have had at least a high school diploma or some college education, which means they've had to integrate into a, the complex settings of the school uh, where they're living t their lives on other people's time and having to deal with exam times and the stresses of that, but while also maintaining their nutrition. 
we can look at the employment levels of people with uh, CF, and we can see a majority of them are uh, either gainfully employed uh, or uh, engaged as active students full time. And this also creates its own uh, issues of complexity with integrating the nutritional requirements and the demands of a busy adult life. Uh, marital status and single status also can introduce its own complexities. In the married setting, you can have some uh, negotiation to do, preferably before the uh, formal ceremonial bond. Um, but uh, you may be coming into uh, a setting in which you have to negotiate with someone else's mealtime expectations. And on the single scene, you may, may have to negotiate with uh, having to deal with mealtimes with other friends who may not be familiar with CF or prospective romantic interest. And now we're going to look at a, uh, how one of our patients deals with her busy adult life and integrates uh, both nutrition and exercise into her busy uh, lifestyle. Greetings, Lisa. Thank you for joining us today. Oh, you're welcome. Okay. Can you tell us a little bit about yourself? Sure. My name is Lisa Madison. I'm 39 years old. I have been happily married to my husband for 17 years. We have three daughters together. Um, Elise is my oldest. She's 14. And I have Marissa, who's 11, and Emma, who's 9. I work full-time in Lancaster as a fourth grade teacher. I'm very busy with my children's lives. I spend a lot of time supporting their activities, so I do have a very busy lifestyle. It certainly sounds so, and God bless you. <laughs> so uh, how do you find the time to fit in your, your nutrition with all of this, these active schedule, this active schedule that you have? Well, I do make a priority of making sure that I eat regularly. I make sure that I eat three meals a day and then at least two additional snacks. We're on the go a lot, so I make sure that I sort of pre-plan ahead of time. So if I know that we're going to be out, I make sure that we have meals prepared, whether it be in the crock pot cooking while I'm working, or I pack a cooler to take with us during the day. And exercise, if it means that I'm getting up at 5 o'clock in the morning or doing it at 9 o'clock at night or fitting it in while talking with friends, I just make it a, a priority in my life. Wow, that's great. What do you, what do you usually choose as your exercise? Uh, I'm a member of the YMCA, so I go there at least three times a week. And I like to do the treadmill or the elliptical machine. Mm -hmm. I also have a treadmill or a step or step whatever in my uh, basement, so I use either of those two on a regular basis. Um, as a family, we also do bike riding, so we go on bike paths, and um, I have a neighbor that I walk with, so any, anywhere that I can fit it in, I, I try to do that. Boy, and it sounds great that you make it such a priority. I do. I try to. Excellent. Do you find that this, these patterns change throughout the year, different weather? although we only seem to have two types of weather here in Buffalo. But. Um, I always try to maintain three to five times a week of exercise, of scheduled exercise, but I do find in the summer, because I'm outdoors more often, that I'll do additional things. Like I said, the bike riding, we do that on the weekends with my family, or a lot of times at night, whether it be 9.30 or 10 o'clock at night, I'll pair up with a neighbor and we'll just kind of leisurely walk around the neighborhood. So there's additional things that I tend to do more so in the summer than in the winter. Mm -hmm. And do you find that you eat a little differently during the different seasons or with your different activities? I do notice that my appetite increases in the summertime just because my activity level increases and I, I eat whenever I'm hungry. So if I find that after exercising or doing a little more physical activity, I'm more hungry, I'll, I'll eat. So I don't necessarily schedule it, but I will eat when I'm hungry. And you always keep something prepared with you to handle that. I do. And I know that when I'm going to be out, I'll pack something in my car Usually we'll have, um, I'll buy a lot of packaged nutritional snacks, granola bars, mozzarella cheese sticks, that sort of thing, just so I can quickly grab it out of the refrigerator and, and take it with us. Okay. Do you find any trouble keeping enzymes with you to? I don't because I carry my purse with me all the time and I always make sure that I have a prescription bottle of enzymes in my purse. Awesome. And how do you do, do anything different if you could say go out with family or friends or at work? in terms of your meal times or your meal choices? Well, when I go out to a restaurant to eat, say, I, I choose the items that I like to eat. Mm -hmm. Now, my portion sizes are usually larger than some of the other people that I'm with, so I do tend to eat more. I'm not a person that necessarily brings home a doggy bag while everyone else does have a doggy bag. Um, but I, I try to make sure that I eat nutritional items. I, I do stay away from the greasier type foods and I just make sure that my meal, my portion sizes are larger than, say, someone else at the same age as I am. Mm -hmm. And do you feel inhibited at all in any settings? I don't. We, you know, I lunch at, with a bunch of female teachers at, you know, at school, and I laugh because they're all eating their, 
salads, and I'm usually eating leftovers from last night's dinner. So they know my situation, and we kind of make a joke about it, and they envy me that I can eat all of these things and still maintain my, my weight. Wonderful. All right. Any thoughts about anything you want to leave our viewers with as parting thoughts? Sure. Um, I, I'm very thankful that I've been able to have a relatively healthy um, life so far. And I think a lot of that is attributed to the fact that I do exercise regularly and I do eat nutritional meals. And I know sometimes it's easy to say that you don't have time to fit these things in. But to me, I, I do make it a priority. I make sure that I eat healthy and I exercise, not only for myself, but I have three children that I have to provide a role model for. So I, I would advise everybody to try to do those things because, you know, it really does work. Well, what if eating becomes a challenge? I want to talk about a few things. One is to try some simple behavioral changes. That might be for adults taking Lisa's advice and planning out meals and snacks, keeping things available. And I'm going to talk a little bit in detail about things that have worked in terms of children's behavior because there's been some very good research that showed that um, uh, setting good eating behaviors early in life can really be one of those things that helps people stay uh, at a better weight. Uh, another thing is to seek experts advice. If things are not going along well, maybe you need to speak with your CF center staff. Perhaps you need to be referred to a gastroenterologist or maybe somebody who focuses on feeding behaviors. Another thing is to think about using tube feedings. Uh, tube feedings come by many names. They can be called gastrostomy feedings, G-tubes, GT, button, or NG feeds, and we'll also focus a little bit on that. There is this booklet that's available on the CF website, cff.org, which talks a little bit about tube feedings. But, but I want to focus a bit first on uh, behavioral interventions for young kids. So a typical child behavior at a meal is taking bites, and a typical parent response is sometimes nothing, not noticing what's going on. Some of the research that's been done in young children tells us that it's really important to compliment kids on eating, to reinforce the good behaviors. Sometimes kids will be chatterboxes. They'll just be talking and talking at the table, and so they're not eating. And typically what parents will do is they'll instruct the child to eat, you know, eat, eat, take more, maybe pick up a fork or a spoon and start feeding their child. But what experts tell us is that the best response is to ignore the child until that child stops talking and takes a bite, and then to engage them in uh, conversation or questions. Sometimes kids will complain. They don't like the food that's there. They may negotiate with you. They'll eat this, if this. And parents typically will coax them or prompt them or maybe even get up and, and make different meals. But probably the best response to that is to ignore their complaints and again, come back to that positive reinforcement. Compliment the child for eating foods. Sometimes kids just get up and leave the table, and parents will coax the kid or instruct the child to come back to the table. One thing that's good is to set rules about meal times and to do this actually before the meals. If you've ever watched the Super Nanny show, you'll see the power of actually writing out a set of rules and posting it where everybody can see it. What are the expectations? When kids get up and run away from the table, don't make it a game. Don't chase after them. Guide them back to the table with a minimum of discussion. Sometimes children will complain of feeling full. And again, parents can coax and prompt and feed them or negotiate. And one thing I think that's important is to set appropriate uh, amounts for meal intake. For example, a toddler's normal portion size may just be a quarter of a sandwich. Now, um, Chris has sort of talked about ways to add extra calories to foods, and so adding extra calories to each of those bites is the right thing to do. You do want to set some expectations and, again, set some rewards for kids who do a good job with eating. There's a picture here of another brochure that's available on the CF Foundation's website, cff.org, and that booklet talks a little bit about this um, uh, these types of behaviors, parent responses that can help um, kids develop good eating habits. Now let me talk a little bit about gastrostomy feedings or tube feedings. Uh, tube feedings are um, when a tube is put directly through the skin into the stomach 
and that's what gastrostomy means. You know, doctors always have to have a fancy word for things. So gastro means stomach and ostomy means a hole. So we make a hole through the skin into the stomach and that way, using a tube, we can give a high calorie liquid formula and usually that's done at night while the child's asleep. The good thing about tube feedings is that you can unhook the tube during the day and the person can go about their life as normal, um, eat meals during the day. And there's two pictures here at the bottom. One's an adult uh, male, I presume, because of the hairy stomach there with the tube attached. And the other one shows you a button that has been closed off during the day while somebody is um, going about leading their life. Tube feeding should be something that people think about early on before there's too much um, uh, weight loss. Again, we want to be proactive. And they can be really uh, helpful for family dynamics. So we'd like to go to a video clip of uh, Peter Bradley, who's a father of two CF children that are followed at the CF Center at Children's Memorial Hospital in Chicago. And he's going to talk a little bit about uh, how they dealt with some conflicts in their family and, uh, and tube feedings. When did um, nutrition and growth become a focus for your children? I'd say probably uh, for Mackenzie was when she was about two and we, and, or, you know, as she became closer to three, we noticed that she was smaller in the CF Center. You know, told us every visit that she was not gaining weight, and uh, and we always noticed that both of them were real small compared to their their classmates or friends. Um, in fact, Annika's still the smallest in her kindergarten class. Um, so it's just something we've always always known, I guess, um, as they've been growing up that they were small, and, and we really worked on trying to gain weight. What strategies did you try to help them gain weight? Um, yelling. <laughs> one of them, but um, no, just at dinners, trying to constantly ask them to take one more bite before they can get down, or, or take, you know, five more bites and you can get out away from the table. We always, we've always made them drink all of their milk at the table. Now, sometimes we give them more than other times based on how hungry we thought they might be or their age, but um, that's pretty much a hard fast rule. Even with uh, the tube feeding, they still have to drink their milk at dinner. Um, but it's just, you know, we've tried the ignoring of them at dinner when they didn't eat and then talking to them when they would be chewing. Um, a lot of different things we tried. Um, none of it really seemed to work very well for very long. When it, when Mackenzie got within about six months of her seventh birthday, the CF Center had us really try for a month to see if we could really get her to put weight on. And we tried, you know, almost every meal to get her to eat. You know, sometimes it was just, you know, making her sit there until she ate. A lot of times it was, you know, cajoling or, or game playing. And for that month, when we went back to the CF Center, she had gained about a pound, I believe. And so everybody was real happy about, about that, but in discussions it came out that there was no way we could sustain that over the long haul. It was very stressful. We, our family hated meal times. Um, and there's just no way you could do that. And at that point, we, we realized as parents that this is something that needs to happen. You know, that for the good of the family, even we couldn't you know, go forward with that sort of stressful behavior. How has tube feeding overall affected your family? Um, I think it's made mealtimes less stressful. Um, we deal more with having good manners now rather than you got to eat, 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 eat constantly. Um, so that's uh, a much less stressful situation. Um, I think it's, it's uh, helped us in that they're not sick as much anymore. Uh, Mackenzie in the second grade, or the first grade before she got the tube, was probably sick with colds or coughs. Uh, I would say for a good six months of her, her first grade life, and and it was horrible. She was constantly taking antibiotics, trying different antibiotics, um, all kinds of things. Uh, her stamina being so low, you know, we knew that we couldn't do things for long periods of time. She would just get tired out. Um, but now with tube feeding, I'd say she's probably had one, maybe two colds in 14 months. Uh, it's been great. Um, she hasn't had any, even come close to being hospitalized. What do you understand the role of nutrition to be in CF care? Um, I believe that from things I've read and, and, and talked to the CF Center that nutrition at a certain age pr helps predict lung function at a later age. And obviously lung function has a lot to do with um, longevity quality of life and so if you can increase nutrition at a young age and
and get that, that stabilized, then that helps lung function later. And you know, that's what we're all fighting is to keep that lung function up. Tube feedings may or may not be a part of your life or your child's life, but the idea is if you do need tube feedings, they're just something that you do, work into your life, um, so that you can lead your best possible life. Here's a picture of one of our patients who decided to hang a little earring off of her gastrostomy button just to use it as a fashion statement. Thank you, Drucy, Chris, and Joe. We encourage you to partner with your CF Care Center and find out how you can use nutrition to stay healthy. You can learn more about nutrition on the Cystic Fibrosis Foundation's website if you go under Treatments and then click on Therapies. There's nutrition information for all ages, information about enzymes, vitamins, tube feedings, bone health, CF-related diabetes, and a link to the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention's website where you can calculate your BMI or your child's BMI percentile. To watch an archived webcast about quality improvements in cystic fibrosis, CF research, patient advocacy related to insurance and government programs, building life skills to manage CF, total lung care, and how to avoid germs, go to the CF Foundation's website under Living with Cystic Fibrosis and click on Patient Education Webcast. As with other webcasts, this one will also be archived. I invite you to join us for the next webcast on Caring for CF Lungs on Thursday, August 16th from Akron, Ohio. You can check the CF Foundation's website later in July for more information. Please partner with your CF Care Center and ask how you can use nutrition to stay healthy with CF. In conclusion, I would appreciate it if you would complete the evaluation form and tell us what other topics you would like to hear about in a virtual Patient Education Day web webcast. I would like to thank you for watching and submitting your questions. Drucy, Chris, and Joe for presenting. Women and Children's Hospital of Buffalo for hosting. Zach, Alex, and Carrie Sparbell for participating in the, in the calorie contest. Lisa Madison and Peter Bradley for sharing their stories. The Cystic Fibrosis Center at Children's Memorial Hospital in Chicago for sharing their information about tube feedings. Judy Marcial for the graphics on the stomach and the pancreas. Rick Vast and the technical crew, Genentech for the unrestricted educational grant, and the Cystic Fibrosis Foundation for making this broadcast possible. Thank you.